week I want to talk about uh, an obvious question. If the Gemara is looking for things that are like Olam Haba, well, there's something right in front of us. We know, we've been taught, that if you learn Torah, if you study Torah, it's like Olam Haba. So why would the Gemara have to spend so much time to try to figure out uh, Shabbos, Shemesh, the sun, what does that even mean? How is that like Olam Haba? All these very difficult, far-fetched ideas, going to the bathroom, really bizarre things. That's like Olam Haba when there's something right in front of us. Just study, study Torah, and you, you have Olam Haba. Now, how do I know that I'm right? How do we know that studying Torah is like Olam Haba? So there's an amazing Rambam uh, in, in the book of mitzvahs. The Rambam was the first to organize all of Torah, all of the 613 mitzvahs, in order. He listed them 1 to 613. And he also lists them in order of importance. The most important one, believe in God, is the first. Uh, to believe in one God, to love God, etc. Those are the next mitzvahs. So mitzvah number three is the mitzvah to love God. And this is, of course, very difficult for us. How do you love God? We have a hard time even understanding what God even means, much less to say that we can have an emotional relationship with God. It's a very problematic idea. And we say it every day, multiple times. You have to love God. Entirely, even if giving up your life for God. How, how do you, what is it? What does it even mean? Like, what do you do? Is there some, you know, you, you want to have a mezuzah, you make a mezuzah, put it in your door, you're done. You want to eat matzah, you chew the matzah, you're done. Shake a lulav, right? Every mitzvah, we, we, it's defined. This is a mitzvah, love God. Well, how do you do it? So the Ram asks the question, how do you do it? And he says as follows, V'zeh, shenachshov v'nitbonein. Let us think and let us ponder b'mitzvosav, in God's mitzvahs, u'ma'amarav, and God's Torah, u'pe'ulosav, and God's handiwork, Ad shenasi gehu until we get it, we recognize God. Venehene bahasagaso betachlas hahano, and we'll have the greatest level of pleasure with our understanding of God. Vizos he haahava mechuyevas. This is the requisite love. But this, the first time I heard it, it I never heard anything like this. My grandfather would always talk about this Rambam. Is the Rambam here outlines a process, a formula of how to love God. Now, like we said, the biggest problem why we don't have love to individuals and certainly to God is because we don't know them. You love someone by knowing their qualities. Well, God is beyond our comprehension. It's beyond, we can't even access it. Less machshava tfisa beklau. Exactly, we see his handiwork, says the Rambam. That's right. And where does that come from? That's the Rambam. The Rambam says there's three things that the Almighty gives us that are almost proxies for us to understand God. He gives us his mitzvos. If you analyze the mitzvos and how, and how they work and how they help a man achieve perfection, on one hand, you analyze God's Torah, the tremendous profound Torah that we have that we can access a little bit into God's brain, so to speak. And of course, God's handiwork, where God creates such infinite, complex creations in the world, you know, where you just study one cell and then the vast complexity of a single cell and you have trillions of them, or, or, you know, or a single neuron in your brain, and you have trillions of them in your, in your brain. Just to think about that for a second and to get a little bit of a, of, of a grasp of, you know, of, of, of God's handiwork, then you come to recognize God. And in fact, there, there's, a, there's four steps here. You have to think. You have to ponder, which is be misboned, which means to think very deeply, to think intently, until you have an insight, hasaga. You have a, you have, have understanding, and then you have a result of those three. You have what he calls the greatest level of pleasure, right? Venehene b'hasargoso betachlis ha'ano. We'll have the greatest pleasure with our understanding of God. So, like we said, if you sit and you marvel on a little ant and you see how it's able to carry eight times its weight, and how everything works so perfectly, and how it doesn't need to be taught how to go find food and store it, and it has all these little tiny organs that all work in perfect unison and harmony, and it's able to create this, this, this entire network uh, of the ants communicating with each other and transporting uh, food. Like you, Wow, you're mind blown, right? 
When you get that insight, you have the pleasure of God, and that's the highest level of pleasure possible. My grandfather, when I was a little girl, used to take us for walks, and he'd, he'd do this. He'd show me the tree, and he'd say, take a leaf on the tree, take a bunch of get around, take a look at the leaves in the tree. He'd explain photosynthesis to me. I could say how incredible the world was, Amazing. how God was, that he, he orchestrated mm -hmm. the universe. Wow. Everywhere he would do this. Anyway, I have a question to ask you. The Hebrew for ponder, can you spell it for me? Nitbonain. Men? Nen and nun taf bet vav nun nun. Vav nun nun. Okay, so let's finish the Ram here. So the Ram quotes where he, where he where did he get this idea from? Vilashan Sifri, he gets it from the Sifri. Sifri is a sister word to the Talmud. Vav Shamakha Eidir Kate said over Samakam, how do you love God? Tamalomar Vahayu had Vrima Ela Sher and Ochimitz of Khayom Alva Vecha. The juxtaposition of loving God and the mitzvah of studying Torah that tells you that Shemetochkach from studying Torah at Tamakir is Misha Amar Olam. You get to know God. That's the Rambam. Now, what's interesting is that if you remember the Mesil Hashem from last week, where he talks about Olam Abba, he actually uses almost the same exact words as the Rambam, and some could even argue that this is where he got it from where he says that Olam Abba is the greatest pleasure that you can imagine. Now, I want to say, perhaps, to answer our question, that the reason why the Gemara does not go to this, look, it's talking about, all, you know, the, you, know you want to find Olam Abba? You can study Torah in this world. You can have the greatest pleasure. So why does the Gemara not just say, what's like Olam Abba? Studying Torah, the way the Ram outlines, gets you to love God. And, and you know, that pleasure is, 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 is akin to Olam Abba. I think the answer is, that it's when the Gemara was looking for something earthly that correlates to, some, to the pleasure of Olam Abba, it was looking for things that are earthly pleasures. What the Rambam here is outlining is Olam Abba itself. Olam Abba is an experience of your soul, a soul experience. This loving God is what we're demanded upon us to achieve Olam Abba here. If you remember, we spoke about, the, about Moshe Rabbeinu last week. We spoke about Moshe Rabbeinu, that he was able to access Olam Abba despite being a regular human who is in our world. Thus, if the Gemara says, how do you get Olam Abba? Via study Torah, the way the Ram outlines, well, that's Olam Abba itself. That's not a corollary. The Gemara has to work hard to try to find uh, a connection in this world, the sun, going to the bathroom, etc. That is like Olam Abba. Now, we don't have so much time, so I want to kind of go through this very quickly. But it's some powerful ideas that, 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 we, that we know maybe, but kind of to put them all together in one little box. Olam Abba, we said, is the goal of the Jew. The goal of life. Why are we here? Why? Everything. Why are we here? Why, why are we living for? Why do we have a Torah? Why do we have all the mitzvahs? Why are we placed in this world? To get Olam Abba. That is clear. Everyone agrees. It's universal. Now, how do, exactly do you do that? So the Ramchal tells us by doing mitzvahs. So my question that I want to analyze tonight is, what about doing mitzvahs brings us to Olam Abba? You do a mitzvah, so what? S you know, typically we think that if you do a mitzvah, you get a coupon. You have enough coupons, you gain access. Something like that. That's what we think. That's not why you do mitzvahs. What, what's not why you do mitzvahs? Maybe. What, so why are you supposed to do mitzvahs? No, that's Okay, not to get Olam Abba. But as a byproduct of that, you get Olam Abba. Can we agree? Well, if that's the reason you're doing it, it's the wrong reason. I, I agree with you. The Rambam says that. No, it's, it's, not, it's not pure. I, I, I agree with you 100%. Okay? And the Rambam says that even though it's not so universally agreed upon. You won't enjoy it as much if you're doing it for that reason. God wants you to be for simcha, and when you do it, just purely to elevate the next person or to do something that is really from your heart. You're not, you'll really enjoy it afterwards. It'll elevate you. This will not elevate you. Maybe. I, I, think, it's, I, think, it's, I think it's debatable. Um, whether or not doing a mitzvah um, with the intention of getting Olam Abba is considered uh, to, be, to be for the wrong intentions. This is a very no. big debate. It's not so clear. Well, it's okay. To, you know, we're all selfish. No, no. Well, okay, not fine. It, it's, it's, it's selfish, but it's for your soul. Yeah, well, it's Shabbos. Okay, so... It's an interesting question. I don't want to get sidetracked with that. It's a very interesting question. Better to do it for that reason than not do it at all. That's oh, it's certainly better to do it for that reason than to, that your friends will think you're, you're cool. You're going to have the of the, of the mitzvah if you do it for this reason. That's it. It's, 
Like of that we okay fine maybe maybe okay so I want to I want to analyze three different approaches that that that, that we find in Jewish sources. Um, we all know that there's 613 mitzvos, correct? 248 of them are mitzvos ase, positive mitzvos, do something, right? Wear tefillin, uh, you know, uh, shake the lulav, all the various sacrifices. Uh, many of them are positive mitzvos. Uh, where it sits, there's a lot of mitzvos that we are very positive mitzvos. And then we have 365 negative los ase mitzvos. Uh, now the Talmud tells us that the reason why we have this precise number, it's not just some arbitrary number, Rather, there's 248 limbs that we have, and each mitzvah corresponds, each positive mitzvah corresponds to, to one of the limbs, and the 365 negative mitzvahs, they correspond to the 365 days in the year. Thus, every day has one negative mitzvah, and every limb has one positive mitzvah. And in fact, if you look at the Marsha on the Gemara there in Makros, he says that the mitzvah of believing in God corresponds to your heart, and the mitzvah of not having any foreign gods corresponds to Yom Kippur, because they are the heart and soul of the Jewish year is Yom Kippur, and the heart and soul of someone's life is, uh, is their heart, and therefore they're the most important positive and negative mitzvahs, and therefore they give lifeblood, so to speak, to the rest of the mitzvahs, positive and negative, respectively. That's the Marsha. Very interesting. Now, there's a Zohar. I don't know a lot of Zohars, but this is a very interesting one as well. The Zohar has a different calculation. He says that there's 248 positive mitzvahs corresponding to the 248 limbs, like the Gemara does, 365 negative mitzvahs, that has nothing to do with the days of the year. That has to do with the amount of muscles we have in our body. So once again, that reflects upon a person. So I think the idea here is a very profound idea. I think if you do all the mitzvahs, every single one of them, it's almost as if you're creating a spiritual body double, a spiritual avatar of your own self. Every mitzvah, every positive mitzvah that you do, you're building one limb, that limb that corresponds to the mitzvah of that limb. Every negative mitzvah that you refrain from doing, you're kind of holding it all together with the, with the sinews and the muscles. So what happens if you do all the mitzvahs? Then I'm, I'm sorry? We'll get to that. Yes, you can. We'll see. The Gemara asked your question. You can. Um, it, oh, well, it's mind-blowing. I know. Okay. If you... <laughs> do all the mitzvahs, well, then you have a perfectly complete spiritual body, and you get to Olam Abba, and it's a spiritual world, and you know who's admitted? Not your physical body, your spiritual body. And that's why there are some mitzvahs that if you don't do those mitzvahs, you get kares. What does kares mean? You're cut off from the Jewish people. Why? Because those mitzvahs correspond to a part of your body that is vital. You don't have a heart, you don't have a liver, you're dead, Right? You don't have certain mitzvahs, you're spiritually dead. And therefore, by doing all 613, you create an avatar, a spiritual avatar of yourself, and that's what you got to Olam Abba with. And by the way, if you do the mitzvahs imperfectly, well, then not every limb has to work perfectly. We know, God forbid, there's so many people on dialysis in America with bad kidneys, right? They're still alive, but they're kind of, a, you know, they're kind of suffering. Or people that have, you know, they, you know, they have to take crutches because their legs aren't working perfectly well. Or whatever. Right? We don't want to be those people. But in Olam Abba, every limb is, well, how much did you put into the mitzvah? You put a lot into the mitzvah, and the limb's perfect and strong and wonderful and admirable. A little bit neglecting a mitzvah, well, you might still have the limb, but it'll be lacking. If you ignore the mitzvah, then that limb will be ignored. Thus, when we look at the mitzvahs as a whole, it's not like the Imani says, let me think of uh, 600 some odd mitzvahs, and he came up with an arbitrary number. No, it's exactly, precisely mirroring who we are. We are recreating ourselves with mitzvahs to create a spiritual body double of ourselves, and get to Allah, above, that's who we are. And by the way, my grandfather would say like this, we know they told the Mishnah that you have to chase a mitzvah which is small, you have to chase a mitzvah which is big. It doesn't matter the size of the mitzvah. I think now it makes a lot of sense. Now that we look at a mitzvah as part of you, if I ask you, uh, do you really need five toes on both feet? Is it so important? Can you really survive with, with only four? And the answer is yes, you could, but I'm not giving up my toes or my toenails. 
It's all part of me. We have to feel like the mitzvahs that we're doing are creating me. It's, it's not some sort of spiritual thing. I get credit, reward, coupons. No, I'm creating myself. And just like if someone said, what's more painful, to gouge out your eye or to cut off your leg? You'll say, whoa, it's me. It's, don't, don't, don't do it. Don't cut off any parts. We can't ignore any parts of the Torah as well. And by the way, in the 1600s, there was a sefer called Sefer Haredim, a book called Sefer Haredim. And that book is a book about this idea. It's, and it actually what he does is he goes mitzvah by mitzvah and limb by limb. And he says, this mitzvah is that limb, this mitzvah is that limb, this mitzvah is that limb, and et cetera, et cetera. And thus, he is actually doing the work, the hard work of connecting every mitzvah to what spiritual limb we're building as a result. And by the way, if you look at the Nefesh HaChaim, he talks about this idea of Evarim Ruchanim, that we, are, if we have a physical self, we have a spiritual self, and they're exactly mirror of each other. And by mitzvahs, we are earning and perfecting and preserving our spiritual life, our spiritual body. Now, to answer your question, how do you do all the mitzvahs? Says the Gemara in Menachos, I believe, uh, uh, 100b, I think so. Have written down somewhere else. When someone studies the laws of an Ola, it's as if they fulfilled an Ola. When someone studies the laws of a Mincha, it's as if they fulfilled a Mincha. In fact, if you look at the morning prayers, you'll see that there's part of the prayers that most of us don't say. It's called Karbanos, where we delineate the various different Karbanos, different sacrifices. And then there's the punchline. We ask the Almighty, may it be the will before you that when I study the laws of an Ola, it should be as if I brought an Ola. And thus, we fill in the gaps of our spiritual avatar. Oh, yeah, so, so, so women have to earn it. Like the Gemara asked that question, the Gemara in Sota 21a asked the question, how do women fill in their gaps as well? So, for example, it says if they have children who do it, that works for them. If they have a husband that, do, that does it for them. Um, or, I would, dare I say, if they contribute towards other people doing it. Um, like, uh, like the Gemara even says that if someone teaches someone Torah, it's as if they have a child. Well, you know, so, unfortunately, some people don't have children. But if you teach Torah, there's other ways to, to, to work around that. But we are shooting for all of them because we want to be complete in Olam Abba, And we also want to do mitzvahs as best we can. And thus, we get to Olam Abba as perfect as possible. That's the first way mitzvahs bring us to Olam Abba. What about the second way? It sounds, like, it sounds pretty hard. You have to do all the mitzvahs. What about the message you don't do perfectly? It's really a long a life of work to try to get to Olam but to do all the mitzvahs, to fulfill everything the Almighty wants for us in its best uh, and highest and greatest fashion. What about, you know, us? You know, how, how do we make, how, how do, are there any shortcuts to Olam Abba? The answer is yes. This is a nice little loophole to know. There are shortcuts. In fact, the Talmud in the book of Avodah Zarah on page 10, page 17, and page 18 gives three stories about three different individuals who were able to kone olamo bisha'a achas, were able to earn, to buy their world, to buy olam haba in one hour. How so? So the Gemara gives three stories. I'll give you, uh, for example, one of them. Uh, one of them is the story of, a, of an advisor to one of the Caesars. And the Caesar says, I want to get rid of the Jews. I'm fed up with the Jews. I want to kill them all. And he asks his counsel. He says, if someone has a wart on their foot and it's bothering them, what do they do? Should they suffer or should they try to re- remove it? So they say, remove it. Okay, I'm killing the Jewish people. They're irritating me. I want them out. So uh, this guy, Katir Bar Shalom, pipes up and says, wait a minute. Two things. First of all, he quotes a verse. The verse says, you can't get rid of the Jews. No matter what you try, nothing will work. So you won't be successful. And B, what's going to be with your legacy? You're going to be the Roman emperor who, who killed his own citizens? You can't do it. So he puts up a convincing argument, and the Caesar says, you know what, I agree. I'm not going to kill the Jewish people, but you, I am going to kill. Why? Because you spoke up, and you... You know, you, you had a convincing argument that beat, that, beat, that beat the king. That's, you're dead. So they make a big procession. They lean him to his death. And this is Nebuch. He's a non-Jew who gave up his life for the Jewish people. And now what does he have to show for it? So there's this lady. There's a lady in the stands, in the cheap seats. And she says to him, I don't remember what the words are exactly, but woe unto the ship that didn't pay the taxes, i.e., woe unto you, your ship going to the channel, but you didn't pay the taxes. You're going to be sent back, right? You, 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 don't, you can't be admitted. You didn't pay the taxes. You, 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 you're not Jewish. Mm-hmm. 
So he grabs a knife, he circumcises himself, and he says, look, I paid my taxes. They bring him, they execute him, and as they execute him, there's a loud batkol, a loud prophetic announcement, Katir bar shalom, mezumon l'chaya olam Katir bar shalom is ushered into olam That's the Gemara. And the addendum to the Gemara is, Bacha Rebbe, when Rebbe, Rabbi Judah the Prince, the, uh, the architect of the Mishnah, when he heard this, he started crying and he says, some people spend their whole lives trying to get Olam Abba, and some people get it in one hour. And in fact, the Gemara gives three stories like this, one on page 10, one on page 17, one on page um, 18, of course, the famous story on page 17 of Rabbi Lezer ben Durdai. He was a, a tremendous sinner who repented, uh, and he gave up his life, he also died. And the last story is about the Kaltstan Tenuri, who was the Roman executioner who was killing one of the rabbis. And then, in a fit of martyrdom, he stopped the torture and he jumped into the fire himself. And on both of those people, despite being lifelong sinners, they got Omba in one instant, in one hour, with one act of valor and martyrdom, whereas everyone else needs to work their whole lives to get it. Now, the punchline of all these stories is that Rebbe, Rabbi Judah the Prince, was crying. Some people have to work their whole lives to get Olam Abba, and these people get it in one second. It seems like there's two ways, at least two, to get Olam Abba via mitzvos. What does a mitzvah do? So we said you have 613 mitzvos, 613 body parts. You do every one, you get the corresponding spiritual body parts, so to speak. What happens? What's a mitzvah? A mitzvah is something that you do. Why? Because the Almighty told you to do it. Otherwise, it's not a mitzvah. Which is, by the way, side point. When you do chesed, for example, don't say I'm doing chesed because of, I'm, I'm, because of my love of humanity. Say I'm doing chesed because the Almighty told me to do chesed. When you honor your parents, don't say, well, that's respect. Parents, that you have to respect your elders regardless of whether or not you're instructed to do so. Rather say I'm doing this because the Almighty told me to do it. Put that aside. When you do a mitzvah, it's a dedication of part of your life and part of your entity, of your, of your essence, to God. And thus, if you dedicate one limb after another, after another, after another, eventually, you kind of lame the bricks of your spiritual half, so to speak, and thus, olam abba, your physical half is discarded, and all you have is left is your spiritual half, and mazel tov, it's wonderful, it's complete. What if someone decided not to go brick by brick, layer by layer, limb by limb, mitzvah by mitzvah to get all my ball. Rather, someone says, I am doing it all at once. I'm not dedicating my life bit by bit by bit by bit. I'm dedicating my life in one fell swoop with one dedication to the Jewish people, with one dedication to tshuva, to repentance, with one dedication to Kiddush Hashem. Whatever it is, but it's something that I'm going to give my entirety of my life, all 613 at once. Yesh, and that's why, as Jews, we're encouraged to be ready to give up our life any second. You know why? The Rabbim tells us, people to give up their lives, these are the holiest people. You know why? Because we don't have to say, well, did they do all the mitzvahs perfectly? I don't know. Let's examine. I saw him talking with his tefillin on. Maybe that limb isn't perfect, right? All, we don't have those kinds of questions about someone who gave up their life for God and for Torah and for the Jewish people. Why? Because we know that their entirety of the act of dedication was complete because they died, so to speak, in, uh, within doing the mitzvahs. And I, I gave a little, little piece of kind of a feeling that I had um, recently. There was a uh, speech given in Yeshiva University commencement uh, address where Robert Kraft, who was a businessman from Boston, he bought a football team in 1994. And he says that when he, he was negotiating with the Budweiser family to try to buy the New England Patriots, he said everything he had ever learned in business school told him it was a bad deal. But then he said a powerful line. He says, sometimes in life, there are things that you're not ready for, you're not prepared, they're not the normal kind of things that you're used to, mm-hmm. but it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, and you have to jump in it, you have to seize it, you have to grab it, don't miss it. And I was thinking, like, he's saying that about buying a sports team, right? Where a bunch of large men are playing with a ball. Our lives. Right? Our lives, we have to always be aware, be ready for an opportunity that comes once in a lifetime. 
an opportunity to not just take step by step, bit by bit, inch your way towards Olam Abba, towards greatness, towards perfection. Rather, it's an opportunity to jump the line, right? to take the elevator, to, to, to achieve it all in one hour. In fact, Rabbi Moshe Feinstein of Blessed Memory, uh, the greatest uh, posek and halachic authority uh, of the past hundred years, he uh, was once disparaged terribly by uh, a fellow rabbi. A fellow rabbi. I'm saying he didn't have no peers, Rabbi Moshe Feinstein. But there was this guy who called himself a rabbi who, who publicly berated and castigated Rabbi Moshe Feinstein and disagreed with him it was a very bad, embarrassing thing and uh, you know, unconscionable uh, behavior. Either way, a couple months later, Rabbi Feinstein gets a knock on the door and all the people that are there, they see this, this guy there by the door. So they say, oh, Mr. Stumma, the guy came to apologize. He came, you, you, you start up with Moshe Feinstein, right? you got so close to the fire, what are you nuts? You got to quickly go apologize. So they open the door expecting an apology and the guy walks in and says, oh, uh, Rabbi, I have a new manuscript of a new book that I wrote. I want to know if you can write me an approbation. People are incredulous. They can't believe what they've seen. You've never seen the like this in your life, right? Preposterous, right? Ridiculous. Chutzpah, right? Could you believe this? And what does Ramosha do? He pulls out a paper with his, what's it called? With his, uh, um, um, what's it called? With his, uh, huh? Letterhead. His letterhead. And he starts writing, oh, what a great rabbi, a great scholar, and the book will be so wonderful. And he gives it to the guy. The guy leaves. No apology, no nothing. Students, his grandkids can't believe what they saw. So they asked him, what's the deal? So he says, Chazal, tell us that it's possible to be kona olama b'sha' achas, to achieve your world in olama in one second with one mitzvah, with one act. And I thought, perhaps this is my time. This is my opportunity. I think we can learn from this story is that we're all going to have these opportunities. It may be that someone did something wrong to you and you have such a zinger to get them back, to put them in their place, and, and, and to justify the unjust, and you hold your tongue. What does the Gemara say? <laughs> this is the Gemara I think in Gittin. Those that get ashamed, but don't fight back, but don't embarrass the person who embarrassed them, Aleim hakasuv omer. On these people, the verse says, "Ve'ohavav kitzeis Hashemish b'gvoros." And those that love God are like the, the, the sun in its in its might. What does that say? If you remember last week, the Torah, Olam Abba is like the sun. People that do that, they achieve Olam Abba with one act of not shaming others. And uh, lastly, what if someone doesn't give up their life, either figuratively or literally, for, for the Almighty? Um, and they didn't do all the mitzvahs. Is it possible for them to still be granted a golden ticket to Olam Abba? So there's a Rambam, which we have to... We have to like stand up when we read this Rambam. I, 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 I would, I, I, that's, what I, that's what I would think. This amazing Rambam in this commentary in Mishnah at the end of Maseches Marcos. The Mishnah there says, very famous Mishnah, Rabbi Hanan Barkasha Omer, the rabbi said, the Almighty wanted to benefit the Jewish people. Therefore, he gave us a lot of Torah, a preponderance of Torah and mitzvahs. The Almighty loves us, and therefore he gave us so many mitzvahs. Now, in light of what we said prior, so many mitzvahs, you have so many limbs to build, wouldn't it be easier if we had four limbs, four mitzvahs, you're done? That's what you would have thought. And now we're told that the Almighty is doing such a benefit for us to give us so many mitzvahs. How is that a benefit for us? Reads the Rambam. Mi'ikrei Torah Of the principal beliefs of Torah, ki kishirkayim adam mitzvah mitariad mitzvahs koroi. When someone fulfills one mitzvah, of the 613 mitzvahs properly, and you should not accompany with it any other ulterior motives, at all, you do it l'shma, which means for, the, for its intention, out of love of God, like we saw previously, behold, he married it through this mitzvah, Olam haba. One mitzvah over a lifetime done perfectly, not lacking anything, no wrong intentions, nothing wrong with the mitzvah, you get Olam haba. How this works, I have a theory. Maybe there's more than one theory. How does doing one mitzvah get you Olam haba? Listen to my theory quickly and then we'll finish because we have Mariv in a couple of minutes. The theory is like this. The Gemara says in Tainus, page 11a, that the Almighty does not, the Almighty's fear, 
Ela manava ein aval. The mind is fair and not unfair. If a Russia, the worst person in the world, does one mitzvah, they get reward. If a tzaddik, the best person in the world, does one sin, they get punishment. There's nothing. There's you know. There's you know. There's no. You know. There's no way to avoid justice. But if someone does a mitzvah, but they're wicked, well, they get reward, but in this world, inferior reward. Someone does a tzaddik, who does one sin, he gets his punishment in this world, because it's also inferior punishment. Perhaps the Rambam is saying like this. Perhaps when someone does a mitzvah perfectly, a mitzvah that's lacking nothing, a mitzvah that's so perfect that has no imperfections, the only way the Almighty can give us a fair, a fair assessment of that mitzvah is if the reward is commensurate to the mitzvah, and just like the mitzvah was perfect, the reward is also perfect. It's not possible to have perfect reward in Olam Hazeh. Doing one mitzvah perfectly, you guarantee yourself a golden ticket to Olam Abba. Now, there's more to say in that. Uh, but either way, to us, I think it's very refreshing to know that there's so many mitzvahs, and as Jews, we try to do as many mitzvahs as we can, but, e- but also with the correct motivations and intentions, to do mitzvahs correctly and perfectly, and doing one mitzvah will grant us eternal life. Thus we can say that there are at least three, maybe even four ways to get Olam Abba. You get Olam Abba studying Torah, like the way the Ram tells us, you get Olam Abba straight up, like Moshe Rabbeinu was able to live in Olam Abba, or you do all the mitzvahs, and you have all your corresponding limbs, you do one mitzvah of giving up your life, do, doing the totality of your existence for God, for Olam Abba, you get Olam Abba. And lastly, one mitzvah, but the mitzvah is not done with any imperfections, rather it's done perfectly. With that, says the Rambam, you'll merit Olam Abba. I wish everyone much, much success in their pursuit of Olam Abba. This world is merely a corridor to next world, which is Olam Abba. Let's make sure that we do our work in the corridor correctly to earn a slot, a covenant slot, in this select fraternity that merits Omaba, and thank you all.